Hey guys, this video is going to be a little haphazard. What I'm showing is my weekend pr pretty much, except for a small job of light electrical and drywall work, which wasn't that interesting. Um, I've got a teardown of my Triumph Spitfire, which I have another video on, which I'll link at the end. But the reason I'm tearing it down is because I have a buyer for it who wants it for the body of the car who wants to rebuild it as a as a standard Spitfire with a gasoline engine and so I have been tearing out all the electrical components out of the front and as you can see I've done most of it I still have that that box there is all custom heater box controls and high voltage stuff inside the dash is a heater box which I've modified with actual electrical elements instead of you know elements that use um, you know the the radiator you know the the coolant to uh, warm the, uh, the the air and then also this black box will go to that is just a plastic project box which contains um, I think that was the old BMS circuitry so uh, that's like the head unit for the BMS a lot of the stuff that I did when I was building this car I mean, a lot of the stuff I, um, oh crap, sorry my battery died, not sure where I was and my rambling, but yeah, for the most part, I tried, we, you know, we tried to make sure everything was not, the electrical conversion, we tried to not mess with the overall body too much. So the frame is pretty much stock, the suspension stock in the front really in the back too with the exception of some adjustable shocks air uh, shocks to carry a little bit extra weight for the battery pack but you can see that I got a little board holding up the transmission there so just an original three rail transmission and on the electric motor the way we were able to do that is basically we recreated the end of the crankshaft of the original motor so everything really so there's a, a machine you can't really see it in there but there's basically a machined piece on the front on the rear spindle of the motor and that has the four bolt pattern that the flywheel original flywheel had and or sorry the original crank and crank end had which the flywheel bolted onto so we recreated that with this proper spacing um, with this machined aluminum part and then bolted the flywheel and then the the clutch disc or the clutch plate and the and the clutch disc to this so whoever buys this even if you don't have the right spline shaft for this year I think this was an um, earlier early to mid 70s transmission so I think it was kind of in between. I think they have a finer spline shaft now. Let me see if I can. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know how many splines that is, but I think they have a finer spline shaft now. But the good thing is, is someone, no matter what year they have, if they go back uh, to the 60s where maybe less splines, they could just change out the flywheel and the pressure plate. And I think if they go up a, a few years to the later 70s, I don't think you have to do anything other than replace the clutch disc because I believe they have the same size. I think this is one of those interim years where the flywheel or the 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 pressure plate was larger. I want to say or the clutch disc was larger. I can't remember. So anyway, but this would work for virtually most years of Triumph Spitfire, and of course the um, the main plate here that bolts onto the end of the motor is a machined aluminum plate and that just bolts to the housing and I mean it fits beautifully I mean it, it like you, it's it's the exact radius when you bolt that to the transmission it just completely perfectly matches it and um, I had a website called EV Addicts at one point that's that's kind of dead but I, the machine shop machine that I love how they they etched that in there and um, but you could never see it because it was covered with other stuff and then of course I think we did a brilliant job with the front plate as well because we have these um, rubber mounts that mounted to the same the, the normal strut tower and so this thing just basically bolted on there and really no modification to the frame in the front 
the real modifications, um, I mean, I might have a few extra holes in the firewall that need to be plugged up. I don't know. I think these are all the stock holes. The fuse block is there, but it's empty. There's no fuses in it. I think I showed you in my first video. That's That's been completely reassigned as a modern fuse block with blade fuses. But I think everything else in the firewall, I mean, I rebuilt all the wiring harnesses, but I think everything else. Now, this is a little bit different. Where I mounted, it's actually loose. I haven't bolted it back. Where I mounted the brake splitter, or whatever you call this thing, I don't know, the brake line splitter thing. Um, and then there's an aluminum plate here that bolts. This, this might be the only place I really made some changes. Um, and I, I mounted my gas pedal to it, which is a, a modified golf cart um, pop box for the accelerator pedal, but it uses the stock, I, I modified the stock Spitfire pedal to actuate it. But I wanted to, sh um, uh, I put this aluminum plate here and bolted it through so that it had more rigidity. Um, so it wasn't just bolted to the body, but there might be a, an extra hole under here that may, you know, um, that I, I don't know, I may have to weld up, I, we'll have to see. I don't, I don't know if it's that bad. And then, yeah, I guess everything else is stock in the front. Um, I, I have to look, I de definitely this harness has some interesting cables. I used a lot of these aircraft type plugs, they kind of almost look like CD plugs. But, you know, I just couldn't figure out a way to get like automo like general automotive plugs without spending a ton of money. But these things held up really well. I mean, there some of them have, like this one has three conductors, this one has three. I think some of them have up to eight conductors, so there's, I used them all over here. And you just unscrew them and they bolt in and they plug in. Um, but yeah, you could see after like seven, eight years, no rust. They still look great. They're all stainless steel. and um, So I'll probably reuse those. Here's another one came off the heater. There's a four, four plug. So I use those everywhere just because I couldn't figure out a way to get like automotive grade harnesses without having to buy real expensive like OEM parts and to, and to pull them off of. So right now I'm working on the back. So here's the trunk again. And I've got the charger pulled. I'm gonna pull this this box out. This will be the only, the other major thing that ha that, that leaves a uh, kind of an opening for the next buyer to deal with. I guess he's just gonna probably just, I mean, probably just butt weld in a, a, a you know, plate there. I mean, I don't think that would take that long to, to fix that. And then, um, I mean, you can leave this fold down plate and just, you just don't see behind it. So, I mean, even if you just primered that, uh, probably be all right. But that's, again, that's a lot easier than fixing a ton of rust. And then the other thing will be these cables coming out of there. There's three of those that are in really well built like well it was drilled holes so those are modified but they're well drilled holes and they should be pluggable and so there's a, i think two or three of those uh, of those coming out and that's the cabling um those two harnesses that uh, run cables through the um through the through, uh, through, through the body from the rear to the front i'm going to show let me put, set the camera down i'm going to show you one thing i'm going to do is some people have asked me like okay so when you pack your cells in that tight and these are those cal 100 amp hour 3.3 volt lithium cells and i've got them in these battery boxes which by the way i, I haven't showed sorry this is going to be stream of conscious i didn't write a script for this but um over here i just want to show you the front that's kind of a lot of sunlight here but let me see if i can get it better Okay, this is the one piece welded front cage that held all of the 22 cells in the front as well as that center section here which held my controller and various other electronics like the main breaker, main fuse, and um, maybe I better get a better shot in here now that it's open. The contactor, I need to move this, this never worked right because this is the, um, right here you can see that's a current, um, 
oh gosh, what do you call it? I don't do this stuff day in and day out. Um, it measures current, so you've got this this thick bus bar going through this this um, thing that that's actively measuring current. And um, why can't I come up with the name of that? But well, you know, this is the state of charge uh, gauge or the 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 sending unit for the state of charge gauge that's inside there. And so state of charge is not as easy as just measuring voltage. You have to measure voltage, you have to know the original pack size, the how many amp hours, and you're, what you're doing is you're measuring voltage and current over time and deriving what you think the state of charge is, which is your gas tank, your gas, you know, how much gas is in the tank, right? And um, it never worked quite right here. The current measuring didn't work quite right. I used it for voltage and temperature and some other variables that it, that it was that worked well for. But the current never worked right. And I think it's because inside this box, with this heavy-duty contactor here and a lot of EMF coming off this magnetic coil, I think it interfered with this guy. So I, my, at my next build, I'm going to move this thing out to... Um, somewhere where there's there's no coils around it probably like on one of the battery casings uh, one of the bus bars for one of the batteries um, so that that's gonna fix that and then this thing is a, just a high power resistor that's a pre-charge resistor um, but yeah that's the controller box and it's a thousand amp MOSFET air cooled controller let me try to get under. I'll show you one thing. I use Anderson disconnects on everything to make it easy to come apart. There. So what I did was, I I, I bought this um, aluminum plate here, and I I um, I polished the front and back of it, and then I got a bunch of that PC grease. That um, what do you call it? heat, uh, I can't think of anything right now, but you know what I'm saying, the, the stuff you put on a, a PC processor to put uh, under the heat sink, the grease to, you know, transmit the heat, and I, I, so I polished both sides of this aluminum plate like a mirror, and I put that heat grease on it, and then I bolted the controller to the top, and then another heat sink that it came with to the bottom, so there's kind of sandwiched, and then I added the muffin fan here, I also added a fan to the to the casing as well, um, but I don't think it was that did any good. Really, this was the the main muffin fan here was keeping this heat sink cool, as well as this was right over the motor. So the motor itself has its own internal cooling. When it spins, that's what these cages. There, there's fans. It's basically an air cooled electric motor as well. Um, and it never overheated, it never had any thermal issues. Um, the controller has thermal, you know, um, yeah, whatever, thermal protection on it. And it never, I never had any problems with this. But, you know, who knows, in my next build, my, in my VW bus build, we'll, if I use this, this situation again, I'll probably just re-envision it and make it a little bit better next time. And then, of course, there's the charger. I'm gonna set up and show you how I can get my cells how I get my cells out of those tight situ uh, of those tight boxes because uh, some people have asked me like okay you know a lot of times we'll get they'll um, oh, let me just show you here they'll bundle sorry this is like one long tape right here what they'll do is they'll bundle let me stand back they'll bundle this was a bun the bundle with five cells in it and um, so they, they put these two aluminum pieces on either side and these straps and they tighten the straps down they just suck them together so you get I got it like a five cell bundle in like art you know pre-strapped like that I don't remember doing I don't or did I do that no I think they did that the place I bought them from so that was kind of cool but um, then I would drop it in obviously into the cage so if I go over here now this is going to be so so stream of conscious sorry about that but I don't know if this is the one. This might, this might have been this one. So then that goes in there, but as you can see, this, the, this set of cells would still loosely fit in there. Like these cages weren't designed to just squeeze against the plastic cell boxes. So what I did in, in, to make it real tight is I, um, 
I bought a bunch of this. Um, I bought a bunch of this half inch, you know, that pink insulation they you know you get at the home improvement store just for insulating walls it's the half inch and I spray painted it black just so it's not pink and I put that you know you can see there's some more remnants of it but that's uh, that was insulating all around and on the bottom there uh, of those battery boxes it didn't help with I mean obviously if you're gonna run in the winter like a like a real production car that's not gonna thermally um, keep your batteries warm or you know it, I mean it helps a little bit but really you need a, an active warming system like maybe some a coolant circulator or something like that but I never ran in the winter so I didn't care about cooling I just mainly care about making sure those those cells are snug down some other people will put like a plexiglass top over them or you know with and latch that down um, so I don't know I'll have to see I might do the same thing next time or or do something different we'll see but I'm going to set up the tripod and I'll show you how I can extract a cell because occasionally or a few times actually I had to actually replace a, a dead cell in one of these and when they're packed in so tight it's it's um, you know that's uh, an incredibly difficult thing so I'll show you how I did it so we have this array of cells here and what I do is I take these two sturdy screwdrivers these have these little corrugated areas that let air through them, I guess. I don't notice that on the newer ones. The newer ones are gray and they're more smooth boxes. They're the same general size, but they're smoother. But with these older blue ones, I get my screwdrivers into there and basically just, just at like an eighth of an inch at a time, let's see if I can do it, just pull it. You're going to hurt it you're gonna just hurt the plastic a little bit sometimes it doesn't always work here's one I was able to get and I've been working it up just kind of not sure what's going on with that one Once you get the first one out, it's just bound up in those bands. Rest. Oh, wow. uh, now my garage is completely unusable. <laughs> Finally got everything out of the out of the car, including some pieces that I haven't shown in my previous clips and I apologize I apologize if I go over something again that's in another uh, a previous clip I just sometimes it takes me days to film this stuff and I forget where I was at uh, any rate here is the accelerator pedal this is I don't know if I can even this is a um, a pop box basically and the way it was originally designed, oh, I should have brought that out. I've got it in my basement, but it had like a, a, a pedal that had a post and it would come up and you could put it on either side. But when you bolt it to the floor of the golf cart, it was made for a golf cart, you, you're, you would step on the pedal and you'd rock it this way. Is that right? No. Yeah, there it goes. So your pedal would be more like from the floor, you would step on it like this. The way I had this mounted in the Spitfire is it was mounted to the top of the firewall upside down and I mounted it in reverse so that you would actuate, if I could do it, I got the camera in my hand this time, but you could see that it's actuating, you know, this way. I can't do it with one hand. But I thought that was clever. I actually used the original Spitfire pedal and what I did was I cut it, I cut off this post that was on the, where the accelerator, uh, I guess, um, what do you call it, the throttle cable was mounted to. I just cut off that post and then I, it already had this, this thing and I think I just tapped it somewhere, yeah. So I drilled and tapped and made it into this rocker. So from inside the car it just looked like a stock Spitfire pedal but it actually actuated this pop box so I thought that was pretty clever um, I think I covered that I used a lot of these 
weird aircraft connectors everywhere because I couldn't find anything else. Here are the main body cables and Anderson disconnects. And you can see I had two of them, one for each side of the pack. And then there's a third one that's a little bit thinner one. And it just had some like BMS and charger cabling uh, in it. I don't know if I need that in the next time. But like I showed before, this this stuff here that it's in is this PVC, this orange PVC. It's I think it's actually a pool hose. It's like a PVC pool hose, uh, vacuum hose. Uh, but it it it's really sturdy, and I you know highly recommend using it because it really does protect those cables well. And you can see that for my main cables, there are these. I think these are two 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 O cables. No, one O. I think it's one over one O gauge. Um, so it's thick and it's got a thick jacket on it. But yeah, these these uh, liquid tight, um, you know, kind of ends and the uh, and the pool hosing really does protect them well. I mean, any kind of road debris is gonna gonna be deflected from these. And there's the motor. I took the flywheel. And the clutch off of it so I'm giving that to the seller or the buyer of the Spitfire but um, I will be selling the motor I think I'm gonna sell the motor because I think I want a bigger one in the bus um, and clearly I'm gonna sell the adapter plate but now without the flywheel on you can see that I have the outer plate that's set up for a Spitfire and it's all high quality machined aluminum and then here you could see I just put the bolts back in this is the um, this is the the custom inner sleeved adapter but basically this these four bolts right here are it is the pattern for the Triumph Spitfire flywheel so the flywheel just bolted on there and then the clutch disc and, and all that so um, if someone has a Triumph Spitfire virtually any year probably I mean not any year but like 70s I don't know if it matters if it's early 70s or late 70s because I think that's the same all that's the same I believe if I remember right that was a kind of a mid 70s transmission but I think it would you go any year uh, as far as the actual transmission adapter and the flywheel uh, bolt pattern this will be an invaluable for someone who's building a Spitfire because that is an expensive piece of machined aluminum there and it's worked flawlessly for 30,000 miles so and the impulse 9 net gain motor again yeah that was 30,000 miles it's seven years old but it's in good shape I haven't looked at the brushes or anything but it's in great shape so uh, and I, I, I think I already covered what the motor mount and all that stuff uh, for the Spitfire as well and that would probably fit different years as, you know as well Again, I'm willing to sell this as a whole package or just the adapter plate and and um, uh, the machined uh, flywheel end, you know, the front motor mount. What you know, so, so in other words, I'll probably sell it in either two ways: the whole package or just the motor and the other pieces for the for the mounting uh, separately. Either way. And I think that's pretty much it. I I pulled out all the rest of the parts. The uh, the 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 J seventeen seventy two charging thing, all sorts of other stuff. So it's all all completely out now. So the car is ready to be transported to the buyer who wants to convert it back to a gasoline car. And then everything else is either going to go in my Volkswagen or it'll be sold to somebody who needs it for a Triumph electric conversion project. When I would have the, my Spitfire for sale on Facebook Marketplace. I had a lot of people that were inquiring about the, the how the electron the batteries basically because I was selling and if you you know you can look at that video um, I was selling the Spitfire where the batteries are all dead, right? And so they need to be replaced. But otherwise, the, it's a working car. Sorry for the train noise. We're right near a train station. Um, but one of the most commonly asked questions is. What kind of batteries were those? Where'd you get them? All that stuff. How much? All this stuff. So there's two of them here. The blue ones, these are the original. They're maybe by a Chinese manufacturer named CALB. 
and I can't remember what it stood for, but the first two initials were China Aviation. So they're made by a Chinese aviation company. They are lithium ion cells, lithium iron phosphate, I think, I believe. I don't think they're the, uh, yeah, I, think they're, I don't think they're the LiPo. Maybe they are, I can't remember. I know those are two different things, but I just don't remember at the moment. Anyway, so the, this is the format. They're about seven pounds a piece. They're 100 amp hour, 3.3 volt lithium ion cells. And what they are, are just like in a laptop, they're like pouch cells that are um, inside of this plastic casing. And they're probably just, I imagine, just soldered together in, ser uh, in parallel and then just bound to these posts. You got a positive and negative. So it's pretty easy. These are just, just a battery, a positive, negative, just like a giant 9 volt, right? But it's a 3.3 volt, 100 amp hour cell. This is the newer version, which they're kind of white or gray. And you can see they actually stamped in here, C-A-L-B. I think they really, this version right here, the blue, is probably over, this was probably manufactured 10 years ago. Whereas this one was probably manufactured like three or four years ago. And when I looked online, they, they're looking like this still. They're, they're grayish or white. And um, they actually have stickers. And it's almost like they went from industrial to consumer grade within the years between when I bought these. Um, the reason I have this new one is because I had two of these completely fail. And the reason they had, the whole pack initially failed, two of them failed completely just on their own. And then eventually I had a whole pack failure. Um, what precipitated a lot of that, the pack failure was a BMS issue. I did have a distributed BMS where there was modules on er, uh, little boards on every uh, cell and they're all sending it back to that central BMS system, that little black box I showed you in the front of the car. And uh, something went wrong with that. It eventually, it just failed and one day I came out, come out to my car, it w was charged and it, all the cells are pretty much dead. And um, I actually don't know if I, did that thing fall out? I was, um, oh, this thing fell out. Come on now. There we go. So actually what I have on here is uh, this, right, this unit right here, I got this from more or less an RC, like a radio controlled uh, stores that sells radio controlled cars and planes and boats and what whatnot um, because the RC industry um, has moved to lithium ion obviously it's lighter and what why not you know you want your stuff to run on batteries and so this is a single cell charger probably not really made for these type of batteries but it is just a 3.3 volt put it outputs 3.65 volts uh, at 6 amps so I'm just hooking this up and actually this newer cell is taking a charge. It was down to like a, a half of a volt and it's, uh, you can see that we're, we're, we are charging it. It's got 3.12 volts in there. So I may let it sit on here for a little bit. Now I can't let it sit on here forever because this thing doesn't turn off. It's not very smart. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll charge it for a while just to maybe put voltage in it. I may be able to leverage some of these that can actually hold a charge in some other application that's not a car. Now this blue box over here, so what happened was when I had the BMS failure, I got ticked off and I ripped the whole BMS out. So I ran without any BMS for the last two years uh, until the cells finally died. And I knew they were on their way out. So I just ripped it out just to, just to get it going again, go to some car shows. I still could get it like a 20 mile range for the last couple of years. Well, what I did was I built a bottom balancer. So if you're running without a BMS, you want your cells to be balanced. And what, what that means is, oh, you can't see it. Let me back it up a little bit. What it means to be balanced is that each of these cells is at the same exact voltage as, as much as possible. Now what happens is as you drive and you charge and discharge, charge, discharge, charge, discharge, the cells all kind of fluctuate a little bit because they all have a little bit different internal voltages. Ultimately when you're buying these batteries, what you want to do, and I'm not that savvy at this, but what you want to do is make sure that they all have a fairly consistent, the, the, the pack of batteries that you're using has a fairly consistent um, internal resistance so that they all will um, have kind of that same bounce back 
whenever they charge and discharge, and they'll all stay relatively balanced. Um, but that's where this guy comes in. When they're not balanced, because you don't have a BMS to keep them balanced, and what BMSs are good for is when you charge the system through a charger that's charging the pack at either end, the whole pack at the same time, so in my case it would have been 140 volts or something charging to bring this 128 nominal pack up to about 136 volts or something at the top. What happens is that char the, the charger will charge the cells and once the BMS uh, says, hey, yeah, we're at the very, the, we're at the very top, um, now t tell the charger to, well, it could tell the charger to shut off if it's charging too long, or the charger can, can go into like, um, what do you call it, where the charger kind of, it, it goes into lower amperage type cycles or uh, ranges when it gets to the top, and that way um, you can slow, you start slowly charging the other batteries and hopefully they top off while other batteries stop charging. So the BMS boards would all, would all had resistors built into them so that when one cell came up to where it was at the top, it would, it, the resistor would start shunting um, the current and then the other cells would have more time on the charger to try to build back up and they would all level up at the top, right? That's top uh, balancing as, as far as I understand it. And again, I'm not an expert on this. It's just what I've been through for a few years. Bottom balancing is where if you don't have that capability, what you do is you charge the cell up. So see, I'm at 3.16 at the moment. But what you could do is you charge your cells up, right? Just so they're, they're, they're top. They're kind of at somewhere around the top, but they're all different. They're all going to be different. And then you pick a voltage a bottom voltage, not, not bottom as in one volt, like where you're draining all your batteries down to failure, but like say 2.8 volts or something like that. Just maybe a half a, a half a volt down from the top or maybe 2.5 volts, something like that. So let's say we wanted to bottom balance them all at two and a half volts. And then what you want to do is discharge them all to where they're exactly two and a half volts. Then you charge the pack up and then they, then they will stay balanced for a little while. And then eventually you might have to rebalance re them again, which is why in my next build, in my Volkswagen bus, hopefully I'll have a, a better uh, BMS system that, can, that doesn't fail and, and handles this better. Because I don't ever want to do this again. But what I did was I built this unit here for bottom balancing, and I used this for two years. I only did it, I think, one time or maybe twice. But what this is, is there's a, this is a digital, whoops, over here, it's a digital voltmeter. And this is a unique digital voltmeter meter. Sorry, there's kids playing in the backyard here. Let me close the window real quick. All right, cut back. I closed the windows and doors. Hopefully it's a little more quieter. So what this is is a digital voltmeter, but it's not just a digital voltmeter. It also has these programmable ranges on it, and these ranges map to relays. So that's pretty cool. What you do with this, or what I did with this, is this unit, I wish I could take off the... The, the top, but it basically has a fan and uh, just a power supply, uh, which I just have a little, this little power supply that goes with it. And really, all this power supply does is powers this little fan, and um, there's these resistors inside this casing, giant power resistors. And then it's just hooked up to this, this, uh, this little digital voltmeter. So this really doesn't do much in, in terms of power. What this does is, is discharge. So you hook these banana plugs up right here, red and uh, black, to the positive and negative of the cell. And then you turn this thing on. Now, let's say I wanted a bottom balance of 2.5 volts, and all my cells were somewhere around 3.2, 3.3, whatever. They're somewhere uh, above that. What I did was I programmed in, in this thing two ranges. One range is the bottom range, which is 2.5 volts. Another range around like maybe say 2.8 volts or something like that. So um, what happens is, is the moment I plug in the cell to this and turn it on, it, because it, I'm above, the, the voltage is above the top range, it's going to click on the relay, which is going to engage these power resistors. So by putting these power resistors in play, what's going to happen is they're going to start um, consuming power from the battery. They're basically just, you know, they're just producing heat. 
and so they're discharging the battery. The battery will eventually discharge, it might take an hour, two hours, whatever, it will eventually discharge down to that two and a half volts. Then we hit the bottom range. That bottom range is programmed to then shut off the power resistors. Then it shuts it off, right? If you guys know about batteries, batteries have an elastic behavior when it comes to charging and discharging. Meaning that when I apply current to it, or when I pull current out of it, sorry, um, it's gonna, the voltage is gonna um, dip. But then when I stop taking current off of it, the voltage will settle back somewhere, right? Same with um, charging it. The voltage will go up real suddenly, but then you know you take the power off of it, it then settles back in. So that's the, the struggle with batteries in that you can't just say, okay, once it's at 2.5 volts, it's done because once you take the load off of it, it's they're gonna pop back up to 2.7 or whatever. Well, what this thing does is when, that, when the load comes off automatically because it hits the bottom range, then it starts climbing back up then it hits the, the, the top range again, that 2.7 volts, and then the resistors turn back on, and then it keeps going back and forth. Eventually, it gets to the point where it starts slapping back. It low, high, low, high, and then you know it's done because it, it, it just it's right in the middle there. The, the one thing that I want to add to this is like a timer circuit, so there's a minimum amount of time, like 5 or 10 seconds, or maybe even 30 seconds between that, so that, because I think I had to replace a relay in it already because it would slap back and, and then the, it, you would wear out the relay. But that's one of the modifications I'm going to make to it eventually if I ever get to it, but hopefully I never have to use it again. Anyway. That's a little bit about what I know about batteries, especially for electric vehicles. Um, hope that was of some interest or help to some of you guys. And if you have any questions, just leave a comment.